you bought shares of Workhorse this past year because some YouTuber hyped it up. So are you a bag holder? So you say, D, what is a bag holder? Well, that's someone that holds a stock that decreases in value until it's worth absolutely nothing. Welcome to MGA Investing. My name is D. This video is part three of a four part comprehensive stock analysis of Workhorse using the dumb method, a method of stock analysis to help you determine if Workhorse is a unique unicorn, a mule, or a thoroughbred. If you bought a mule, you're a bag holder. There's no way around it. The first video in this series covered the D and the dumb method, which detailed why investing in companies with a durable competitive advantage is important for the long-term success of your stock portfolio. This second video in this four-part comprehensive workhorse stock analysis detailed the U, which represents understanding how the company makes money and the significance of its importance for the investor. You can find both videos and links below in the description. This video will address the first M in the dumb method, sometimes referred to as M1, which which is about measuring management effectiveness. As a short recap, the done method, if you watch any of my other stock analysis, is an easy to replicate and reliable method for analyzing an investment without the need for sophisticated math, insane spreadsheet skills, or analyzing software. If you can read, well, you can analyze. I've used this stock analysis process successfully for nearly two decades. Having a process is essential to long-term success in the stock market. It adds needed structure to the decision-making process and neutralizes emotions and biases in the buying and selling decision that can often cloud good judgment. In the words of Edward Deming, if you can't describe what you do as a process, you don't know what you're doing. M or M1 in the dumb method, as previously said, represents management and focuses on measuring management's effectiveness and their ability to materialize the dream of the company's purpose in becoming a reality. In the case of Workhorse, their dream would be to bring a last mile delivery, first purpose built electric mobility solution into reality. There are several metrics I use to measure management effectiveness. They are ROE, ROE, a, ROI, debt management, compensation, and a look at free cash flow. ROE or return on equity is about how much profit a company can make relative to shareholder equity. Now be careful when looking at this number because it could be skewed due to workhorse's high debt levels, which I'll talk more about shortly. Also, when looking at this number, you always want to compare it to its industry average. Workhorse's ROE is negative 78.30% compared to the automobile industry average of 15.05%. ROA or return on assets which is how much profit a company can generate from its assets. Assets, of course, are things of value a company owns that can be converted into cash. Workhorse's ROA is negative 39.25% compared to the automotive industry average of 5.47. ROI, or return on investment, measures the amount of return on an investment relative to the investment's cost, essentially a return on cost. One of the challenges with giving too much weight to ROI is that it is an isolated measure. It doesn't account for how long an investment is actually held. Workhorse has an ROI ROI of negative 40.89% compared to the industry average of 8.98%. And speaking about return on investment, the company sold its investment in Lord Sounds Motor Corp to Foxconn. That's right, it sold its 6.2 million square foot factory in Lordstown, Ohio to Foxconn. If the name sounds familiar, it's because it's the same Taiwanese hardware manufacturer that makes the Apple iPhone. Now, not to go too deep down the rabbit hole here, but it's really tough to resist. Guess who else Foxconn is working with in the EV space? Fisker, the California-based luxury electric vehicle manufacturer started by Henry and Gita Fisker. Foxconn signed an agreement to co-develop and manufacture its new vehicle under the Fisker Pair program in North America. The Pair is a smaller version of the Fisker Ocean. These vehicles will also be produced in the Ohio factory. I think we can look for Foxconn to be a real player in the consumer EV space in 2022 and beyond. Back to where I started. The net of Lordstown's transaction between Workhorse and Foxconn was worth $105.1 million dollars but the company lost $76.5 million directly related to that transaction. So not a good return on investment for Workhorse. Moving on to debt, there is some daylight. They currently have more cash than debt. They're showing about $230 million in cash and total debt of $180 million. I'd advise some caution because cash flow is negative, and if they were to incur any more debt, I'm not sure how well they could cover the additional debt. Over the last three years, most of their debt financing has come from hedge fund financing. In mid-2020, they significantly increased their equity offerings by selling more shares. And in 2021, they issued another $16 million share 
shares to raise additional capital. So more share dilution while not actually bringing any additional apparent present or near future value to existing shareholders. Debt doesn't scare me that much if I understand its purpose. I can see that the cost of sales significantly increased from 11.5 million from 2.8 million, same quarter in the same quarter last year. The vast majority of these increased costs came from an increase in consulting costs, higher compensation costs due to increased headcount, and write downs of about $10 million. Selling and general administrative expenses nearly doubled from 5.9 million to about 10.5 million. Most of that 3.2 million increase came from an increased headcount, severance pay, stock based compensation, high legal costs for the USPS lawsuit that Workhorse decided to drop, and higher insurance costs. Look at the difference in net cash used in operating activities in 2020 versus 2021. This is for nine months into September. In 2021, it had 110 million versus 37 million in 2020. That's a difference of about $72 million. Now, I understand chasing the USPS deal and trying to get the C1000 working properly. But outside that, I'm just not really comfortable that Workhorse was either effective in their use of debt. The reality is there's not enough cash coming into the business. The company had a long-term debt to equity of 90.15% compared to an industry average of 60.25%. Another area of focus for me is management compensation, which is critical to determining if you're looking at a good company run by competent, properly incentivized leadership or just a money grab for executives and board members. The fact is compensation provides incentive and incentives, while well, they drive behavior good or bad. So let's take a look at management compensation. Richard Doc is the new CEO and director. He was previously CEO and director of Delphi Technologies and replaces Dwayne Hughes, the former CEO of Workhorse, who resigned but is still on the company payroll as a paid consultant, thus increased consulting fees listed in the recent 10Q. Here's a comparison of the compensation for the previous and present CEOs. According to the Workhorse Compensation Committee, the terms around CEO pay for Dwayne Hughes was set so that 70% of his compensation was at risk or variable in nature. You see that on the left side of the table where you see that 20 22% of his compensation is fixed base salary, 22% was bonus, 29% was stock options, and 27% was restricted stock. We're looking at Richard Dock, the new CEO, and he's only been CEO for about five or six months at the time of this reporting. His compensation is set that only 67% of his target total compensation qualifies as at risk or variable in nature. So immediately I started to wonder why only 67% of his compensation was at risk. What are they possibly setting him up for? I'll get into this a little later in the next video as to what I think might be the reasoning for this difference for the two CEOs. You can see that 33% of Richard's compensation is base salary, $475,000 versus 22% for Dwayne Hughes when he was CEO. You can see that 33% of Richard's compensation is base salary, about $475,000 versus 22% for Dwayne Hughes when he was CEO. 33% is annual incentive and 34% is restricted stock. There are some other bonus details for the C-suite and NEOs that you can find in the most recent Schedule 14 a but for the sake of time i won't cover all that in this video in terms of other executives robert Gennon took the reins of ceo from the interim cfo greg ackerson Gennon previously was ceo for privately held family rv group the fifth largest rv dealer in the u.s workhorse had two of its top finance executives resign in september 2021 most of this instigated as part of the shakeup when the new ceo richard doc took the helm as he looked to fix product and production processes concerns at the company now the chief operating officer rob willison also left, Workhorse decided to eliminate the chief operating officer role completely after Rob's departure. The year Rob left, well, he made $401,000 in cash, two hundred twenty-five dollars in equity for a total compensation of just over $626,000. So there was quite a bit of shakeup at the top, which can be disconcerting if you're a current shareholder. Here's a look at key executive compensation as it was laid out in 2019 under a full year with CEO Dwayne Hughes. Look at the jump in base pay for CEO, 73%. As I said before, compensation Compensation is critical to understanding a company you want to buy because as I mentioned already, compensation provides incentives and incentives drive executive behavior. All too often, the wrong compensation plan can create behaviors more aligned to personal gain instead of sustained increase in shareholder value. Now take a look at what the compensation committee put together so that executives could cash in even more. It reads, to which our named executive officers were eligible to receive performance-based cash bonuses based on certain quantitative and qualitative performance metrics. Look, I'm all 
for bonuses, but for a little company trying to get traction in a competitive, newly formed marketplace, well, I wonder if the wrong behavior was driven. It goes on to say, our CEO bonus target is set at 100% of base salary, 75% for our COO and 50% for our general counsel. Our name executive officers, maximum bonus opportunities were 200% for our CEO, 100% of base salary for our COO, and 75% for our general counsel. Man, can you imagine that type of bonus structure at your work? There's no telling what you might do to make those numbers work. The fact is CEOs with the right pedigree add credibility to the operation, whether they're actually good for the job or not. The benefit being it helps the company attract more of the right investors. It's no different from investment firms that hire graduates from Ivy League schools to put on the company roster to attract the right clients, irrespective of whether those Ivy Leaguers are actually truly qualified for the job or not. The truth is in the pudding. Few firms consistently beat the market long term. Again, incentives drive behavior and that may not always be to the benefit of the employees working there or the shareholders. So was Workhorse a few rich guys just getting richer? I don't know. You tell me. What are your thoughts? I'm not in love with the compensation package, so I would have a big cause of concern on this piece. Here's one more piece that if you're a shareholder, might get you just a little hotter. The compensation committee has a long-term incentive program that provides for the granting of stock options and restricted stock to executive officers to both motivate executive performance and retention as well as to align executive officer performance to shareholder value creation. It states in 2019, we, that's the compensation committee, awarded stock options to our CEO and COO. Our CEO, Mr. Hughes, received a grant of a million stock options with a grant date fair value of $634,300. Mr. Hughes also received a grant of 50,000 stock options with a grant date fair value of $31,715 for his role as director. Remember, he had two roles. Mr. Wilson, our CEO, received a grant of $400,000 stock options with a grant date fair value of $170,600, which vests rateably over a four-year period. Now, we believe that awarding stock options provides a performance-based element to our mix of long-term compensation by directly tying the interest of our executives to stock price appreciation. So, So if you can get the price per share to go up, you will be well compensated. It goes on to say during the negotiation of Mr. Hughes employment agreement entered into in 2019, it was determined that his February 2019 stock option grant would vest immediately upon execution of the agreement, which occurred November 6, 2019. So he didn't even have to wait. He got his money early. That's how valuable the compensation committee and the board thought Dwayne Hughes was. Richard Dock, the new CEO, signed to a good deal as well. The next thing I glance at is free cash flow, which can be difficult to make sense of with many growth companies. Companies, obviously. Free cash flow is the cash left over after the company pays its operating expenses and capital expenditures. This is a better measurement for more proven profitable businesses, of course, but I like to look at it anyways. Growth companies come with a lot of risk because in a world of unknowns, there is so much more unknown about companies within a growth industry, especially EV related. Workhorse has a negative $141 million in free cash flow, so they're bleeding money. Having looked at ROE, ROA, ROI, debt, Management compensation and free cash flow, the workhorse story from a management perspective isn't looking very good. So I would give workhorse a management score of three. Do you agree with my assessment of workhorse's management effectiveness? Am I too harsh in my assessment? Am I way off the mark? What do you think I missed in this part of my analysis when grading management's effectiveness? I would love to read your thoughts in the comments below. Remember, the objective of M1 is to measure management effectiveness in their ability to materialize the company's vision into a reality. And for Workhorse, that meant bringing a last mile delivery, first purpose built electric mobility solution into reality. The summary of the Workhorse dumb score for now is durable competitive advantage a three. Understanding, which is understanding how they make money, which I scored also a three. And management, lastly, another score of three out of a possible 10. I recommend if you haven't seen the durable competitive advantage and understand videos to go back and watch those videos so you have a better sense of how this all comes together as a stock analysis scoring system. As I said in the last video, it's not looking good so far for Workhorse, but let's move through the final pieces of the analysis in the next video to see the process all the way through. I can't keep repeating this enough. The very analysis of management effectiveness speaks directly to the importance of having a solid, consistent stock analysis process that leads to sound stock selection for your portfolio. If you found this video helpful, click that thumbs up icon and subscribe so you can be the first to be notified of the release of part three of this four-part workhorse comprehensive stock analysis using the dumb method, the most comprehensive stock analysis of workhorse on YouTube. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next video in this series.